morning. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, that was a beautiful song. Sometimes I've got to admit, sometimes I just don't sing. And I just listen, close my eyes, and just listen to everyone sing. And it's really beautiful and very touching. Yes. Well, welcome. Welcome to Enfield. It's so good to be here. I love church. I know that um, David was saying there's just something special about coming to church, like it's our place. And um, I really think, I mean, wherever we are, the Holy Spirit is. Um, and I think you can really feel that in a place. Um, but I also want to welcome those online as well. It's good to have you join us. Now, I've come from a really full weekend this weekend. Lots have happened, lots of good stuff. Um, but sometimes, where I think where we come from on the weekend, we bring that with us to church. So I don't know what your weekend has been like. I don't know what your morning has been like. Maybe it's been busy. Maybe you felt a bit frantic or rushed. Um, maybe there's sickness in your family. I'm not sure. But I just want you to take a moment to just recognize what you've brought with you this morning. Um, and it's okay, whatever that is, that's okay. But it does influence how we encounter God. And that's okay too. Um, but if we just take a moment maybe to have a collective breath. <sighs> it's good. Thank you for indulging me with that. <laughs> um, so we're going to be looking at um, Isaiah 9 today. It's a familiar passage. Um, but before we dive in, I'm just going to pray for us all. God, we thank you that you are our daily bread. We thank you that we have uh, your living word to feed off um, help us cherish that, um, help us hunger for it, and I just pray that you would hide me behind the cross today, God, as I speak, um, that it would be your words speaking through me, um, and that you would just do something wonderful here this morning. Amen. So we're going to be looking at some Old Testament goodness this morning. Um, now, this passage might be really well known for some of you. And if that's the case, I want to encourage you to see it with fresh possibilities this morning. Fresh possibilities of what God might want to say to you personally and fresh possibilities of what God might want to say to us as a community. So if you have a paper or a digital Bible, I'd love for you to get it out. Um, so in the Old Testament, God often chose certain individuals to carry his messages uh, to the people. And these individuals were called prophets. So Isaiah is one of these prophets. So even though these words come out of Isaiah's mouth, they're actually directly from God. So let's see what God has to say. Oh, this clicker is a bit temperamental. There we go. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So we're going to look at three aspects from this scripture. Three things that these verses tell us about the God we serve. First, okay, my clicker's not working, Steve, so you might have to help me out here. First, we're going to be looking at God's nature. What's he made of? His genetics, if you like. Second, God's character. How does he respond to things? What's on his heart? And third, God's kingdom. What does God's place of dwelling look like? And why is it relevant to us? So if we go to the next slide. So I want to start by talking about birds. Are there any bird lovers in this crowd? Show of hands. Oh, oh, Ian's very enthusiastic. So have you ever noticed that they tend to get themselves into all sorts of mess? Sometimes flying into a building and not being able to find their way out, or maybe caught in something and unsure of how to get free, their wings flapping with increasing panic. I've encountered birds in both situations, and naturally, I want to help. But most of the time, the closer I get to them, the more distressed they become. Sometimes they get so scared, they fly into something and hurt themselves, and then I just feel terrible. My attempts to help them are significantly hindered by a few things. 
First, I'm like a giant compared to them. <laughs> and also, I don't speak bird, so I can't communicate very well with them. So my approach to the bird is probably seen more as a threat than anything. At this point, I'm thinking it would be a whole lot easier if I just became a bird for a moment. I could sympathize with them and the mess they find themselves in and attempt to talk them through how to get out of the situation and maybe offer some tips on how to not find themselves back there in the future. Good plan, right? Except it'll never work for the obvious reason that I cannot become like one of them. Now, you probably know where I'm going with this. In these verses we read just now, Isaiah is introducing the one who did become like us, to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. This one was so full of compassion that he gave up all his outward glory and became a servant to all in order to reach the ones he loved. Fully God and fully man. Deity coming in humanity. Oh, not sure where we're up to, Steve, with the, with the slides. Here we go. My clicker's working now. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with me. For to us, a child is born. Humanity. To us, a son is given. Deity. Jesus, in his earthly life, voluntarily limited the use of some of his divine attributes. This self-emptying was an expression of humility and solidarity with humanity. Instead of using his divine attributes and power for personal advantage, Jesus lived in dependence on God and in harmony with the limitations of human existence. From the very beginning, Jesus' purpose was clear. This beautiful, perfect, and life-saving gift was addressed to us. It reminds me of those Christmas labels you can stick on to you know, the wrapping that says to and from on it. If Jesus had had one of these attached to him when he arrived, I think it might have said to humanity from God. I think sometimes we can talk about God in a way that puts his intentions into question. Like perhaps he's not for us, but actually against us. But I think this is the number one demonstration of God's truest intentions. And that is, he loves us deeply and is a giver of good things, very good things. This gift was so expensive, it cost God his life. I've never given anyone a gift that expensive. Obviously, I'm standing here today. So what's God's deal? Did he get the address wrong? No, it's simply this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, theoretically, Jesus could have come as a fully grown adult, even as Adam and Eve were created the work of the cross wouldn't have been any less precious to us. But for Jesus to identify with humanity to the full extent so that we might relate to him as one of us and to demonstrate the servant nature of God, he came as a baby. With all the struggles and in all the fragility, God's answer to a broken world was a baby. We see the purpose of this plan in the rest of the passage. And he will be called, if we could go to the next slide, Steve. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the government will be on his shoulders. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Some might ask the question, does humanity really need another government? Another leadership body that promises great things to come but never quite delivers? I say that's a perfectly legitimate question and one that God also understands. Proverbs 13:12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. 
God knows the hope we hold out for, a hope for complete joy and peace for all humanity. And he also knows this hope can wear thin at times, which is exactly why Jesus came. Jesus wasn't just bringing hope, Jesus was the hope. When we interact with a suffering world, how can we not wonder, has there ever been a time in history that people did not need a wonderful counsellor who listened deeply and guided gently, or a mighty leader who was both strong and full of wisdom, or a parent-like figure who was always emotionally available? or maybe a sovereign whose desire was to bring peace to the people of his kingdom. I find these verses both confronting and comforting because on one hand, it shows the stark difference between what God's kingdom is like and what is going on in our world right now. And you, like me, might cry, God, what is going on? What are we to do? Help us, help us. And on the other hand, we can breathe a ragged sigh of relief knowing this is not what God intended for his creation and he has plans to not leave it in this state. But notice, in these verses, before God tells us what his master plan is, he describes the character of the one who will bring it about. Why is that? Why not get straight to the plan? Here's what I think. Something about this intervention plan is different. Different to all the world leaders who meet time after time only to have their latest peace treaties come to nothing. Different to all the politicians who so readily promise us what we want to hear and then the day after they're elected, they go back on those words. Different even to the people in our own lives who we have relied on only to be left betrayed or disappointed. I'm not trying to bag on people, I'm just pointing out the reality of our broken world. I think there is a difference with this intervention plan though, and that is because of the person behind it. And it seems as I would agree, he says this person will be a wonderful counsellor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace. So let's take a closer look at these. Wonderful counsellor. Anyone can give counsel, right? Doesn't mean it's always good counsel or wonderful counsel. In fact, I bet you could recall a time that you have received some not so great counsel. I can. It went something like this. I'm sure that strange engine noise is nothing to be worried about. Or procrastination is an art form. The deadline pressure will help you perform better. Or maybe one with less dire consequences. The five-second rule applies to everything. Unless it's chocolate, then it's 10 seconds. (laughs) Seems legit. But of course, the counsel that Jesus gives is different. Firstly, he actually knows the person he is giving counsel to. Psalm 139 describes it like this. Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You made all the delicate inner workings of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. Another reason Jesus' counsel is different is because he knows what we actually need for our lives. So he doesn't give empty pieces of advice. Ephesians 2.10 states, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Meaning that he knew beforehand what we would need for the journey, and he's prepared it all for us. And that's specific to each and every person. 
I don't know about you, but that is deeply reassuring for me. <laughs> okay, so what about mighty God? Well, we see this from the beginning of creation, where God's ability to bring the world into existence with a mere word reflects his ultimate power and authority over all things. We see it through the miracles of the Old and New Testament, the parting of the Red Sea, the sun standing still, multiplied oil for a widow, new life despite infertility, and of course, through Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead and turning water into wine. I recognize the next title, Everlasting Father, is not something that might sit well with everyone. For some of us, it might bring to mind interactions with a father who was attentive and gentle, someone who protected and cherished us, someone who reflected Psalm 103.13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. But for others, this part of God's character might feel very foreign because our encounters with our fathers or father-like figures were full of pain or betrayal, or just apathy. If that's you today, I am so sorry, and I want you to take comfort in the fact that God isn't limited to one name. He's given us four here, and there are many more, because there is far more to know about God than one title can ever hold. So maybe right now, it's enough for you to see God as a close friend who will never leave you or someone with motherly love towards you. Like Isaiah 66, 13 says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. Until the image of God as father is restored for you, and there is no time limit to these healing journeys, my prayer is that God would continue to reveal himself as the kindest person that you know. Finally, Prince of Peace. In Jesus, the requirements for ultimate world peace are fulfilled. When he tells us we can have this peace, we know he can deliver because he lived it out. Jesus says in John 14, 17, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. At no point was Jesus ever frazzled or rushed. He always responded in an appropriate manner, and he didn't ruminate about how things could go wrong. He was always calm, despite being surrounded by crowds of thousands, and he never gave into the frantic push of the world to get things done or to be successful. Wow. What wonderful qualities all these things are for someone to have. And because God cannot work in opposition to his character, he must follow through with actions that align with these qualities. So what would those actions be? Well, Isaiah tells us, the government will be on his shoulders of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. The prophecy that the government will be upon his shoulders will come to complete reality at Jesus' second coming, an aspect of the messianic prophecies that the prophets did not get to see. There will be a time when Jesus' kingdom will come in fullness on earth as it is in heaven, there will no longer be a need to pray that prayer because it will be a reality. We say right now that Jesus reigns above, and that is certainly true. But Isaiah envisions a time of complete peace and righteousness in the world. That has not happened yet. Isaiah, just like us today, did not know when all these things would take place, only that they will happen because the word of the Lord has declared it. And we are told how it will come about. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Isaiah tells us, and this later proves to be true, 
that Jesus will come from the line of King David. You see, God had recognized the mess of human life a long time ago, but he had actually counted in all of humanity's chaos before he started creating things. In God's kindness, he had given guidance through prophets and provided ways of making amends through priests. But still, humanity continued to choose their own path, turning away from their loving creator and the one who actually had their best interests at heart. It wasn't enough to tell people how to live. God had to demonstrate how to live. As part of this plan, God had made a covenant promise to King David, which was a continuation of the earlier covenants that God had made between himself and his people. In the Davidic covenant, God promises that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from the lineage of David and would establish a kingdom that would endure forever. The Davidic covenant was unconditional because God did not place any conditions of human obedience upon its fulfillment. What a relief. <laughs> the surety of the promise made rested solely on God's faithfulness and did not depend at all on David's or Israel's obedience. And it's a good thing too, because even though we are told in 1 Samuel that David was a man after God's own heart, we see that David, like us, was a broken human too. In fact, his life included sexual exploitation and murder. This is why Jesus had to come. This is why Jesus was the only one who could break the cycle of destruction that plagues creation, not least of all in the hearts of people. Jesus never lied or cheated or acted with selfish motives. He wasn't corrupt. He didn't exploit people. Even though Jesus entered into the mess, he never perpetuated the mess. He was perfect in every way. This meant that he was the only one that lived in right relationship with God. And by doing so, he paved a way for us to be made new and have relationship with God. Romans 5, 18 to 19 says it well. Um, I love how the message version puts this. So that's what I'm, re I'm reading from. Here it is in a nutshell. <laughs> Only the message would say that. Just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. But one man said yes to God and put many in the right. Guys, this is good news for a grieving world. It's all coming about because God declared it so. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I looked up the definition of zeal, because I'm a words person. It's great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. That's how committed God has been this whole time to our broken world. When Jesus came, he came to establish something for eternity. At the moment, we are in a time of now, but not yet. Now, because Jesus has already become like us, to show us the way to freedom. And not yet, because the residue of brokenness still remains and will until Jesus returns. But we know he will return and establish his government of peace. Because the zeal that followed through on the promise of a baby all those years ago is the same zeal that will accompany Jesus on his return. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. God, we just thank you. We thank you that you are a faithful God even when we are faithless. We thank you that nothing can hinder your plans and that the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish something wonderful 
it already has in Christ Jesus, and that is what we celebrate at Christmas time, the coming of this beautiful, perfect gift, one who became like us. But we also thank you for what is to come. We thank you for the hope that is to come, the hope that we hold on to as followers of you, that we will be with you for eternity, where there will be no more crying or pain or sorrow, and we can enjoy your presence in the full forever. God, for some of us, that hope needs to be reignited this morning. Perhaps it's grown dim. And if that's the case, God, will you just bring it to the forefront of our minds? Would you unhaze that picture for us and help us cling on to that, to shout it from the rooftops, to share it with our friends, particularly in this season of Christmas? Thank you, God. Amen.